fans. Here we are live. Good to see you all on a Sunday. We have a great show today. Hello, saying hello to some people. Joining us, uh, I look at some of the metrics, they call it. Uh, we have a lot of fans. Hello, Gil. We have a lot of fans in the United Kingdom, a lot of fans in Australia, a lot of fans in New York. It's good to see you. I was not live last week. Hello, Sandra in New Jersey. I used to know a, know a Sandra from New Jersey. Hello, 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 Norway. Very good to see you. Hello, UK. Yes, I understand that we are on uh, a lot in the United Kingdom. Hello, Malaysia. Yes, Teresa. Good to see you, Teresa. Hello, Bobby in Hawaii. Uh, I'm very excited because Lisa Miller Katz will be joining us. And much like Phil uh, and Lisa Helfrich, Lisa Miller Katz was there from the beginning to the end and knows uh, more about the show than most people on the planet. Hello, Leo. Yes, I've missed all these familiar names. Good to see all of you. Hello, Karen. Good evening. Karen in Plymouth. England. Yes. Great. Oh, interesting. Ah, uh, my friend Allison, who has acted herself and been cast in a few things. So uh, today we'll be talking to Lisa. I'm so excited because uh, A, I love Lisa and she is uh, fun to talk to. She had an office that was right down the hall from me. Uh, and I'll share a couple of things that she shared with me. Uh, and uh, many other things. So it will be fun. Uh, hello, hello, Croatia. Hello, Australia. And hello, Los Angeles, Lisa. Hi, how are you? It's so good to see you, Lisa. Um, so good to see you. So Lisa, here, uh, I, by the way, I thought that was a great picture of you that I posted in um. your office. Did you like that? I loved it. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Because <clears throat> I will say this, a lot of people, uh, uh, so you know how many photos I take, uh, which is a, just a crazy amount. And I think I probably popped into your office for, I don't know why, I might have just needed photos of everybody for some reason. Uh, uh, but most people don't like the way they look in photographs across the board. Right. And so I thought that was a great photo of you. And I like that. Oh, and also that photo has a picture of wet ones on my desk. That photo was probably taken in thousands. Right? So probably. Ahead of the with the thermophobe thing. Ah, uh, <laughs> well, uh, as you know, uh, your friend Ray Romano, who was on Everybody Loves Raymond, uh, he is the king of uh, um, Perel. And so he was way ahead of the curve. He would have in his office a big fishbowl filled with little dispensers, the, the, the littlest bottles. So he had a lifetime supply when it hit. Um, okay. All right, Lisa, uh, one of the reasons I even started doing this, and selfishly I get to see people I haven't seen in years, but uh, I had read Desi Arnaz's autobiography and I had read about you know, uh, the Lucy show and I was like, oh, I wish... I wish the people in casting, I wish the people in set design had written a book about I Love Lucy. Because when you're in the industry, you kind of like, this is my next show and now I'm doing it. And now I'm going to the next, right? It's work. Very much. Yeah, so you don't know that necessarily it's going to become an iconic TV show that's watched around the world forever. Right, correct. Absolutely. But, yeah, so you're trying, you're trying to pay your rent and make sure you don't get fired and make sure the boss is not happy. So now... Lisa, your, uh, what, what I want to get into is like how you got into casting to begin with, and then we're going to get into the show. Okay. Um, I, I stumbled into casting, um, studied film and television at Loyola Marymount, and um, had a job at a college working for a producer at the Playboy Channel. And pretty much the first day I was there, I was like, anything to get out of the Playboy Channel. So... <laughs> For uh, a while, um, a friend of a friend introduced me to 
casting director and I started uh, Peter Golden, who uh, was the head of CBS eventually, but I worked my way up with him. We worked for Grant Tinker's company. And um, then I worked with another woman and we did a bunch of sitcoms together. And then I went off on my own. Um, Raymond was the second pilot I ever cast. Pretty new to the game. Wow. So ju just because we have an international audience, Loyola Marymount is a college in Los Angeles. Correct, yes. Uh, 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 you were studying acting? at school I, or i was studying i acted in high school got to college knew that was not for me knew i did not have that that skill set or that um or that desire you have to really you have to really want to be an actor and how long how long into it uh uh six classes in at the end of or at the end of college oh no the i i knew high school i, I knew coming out of high school this was not really what i wanted to do i auditioned for a play and i think i snuck out the back entrance like i was sitting there watching <laughs> actors audition and i knew this was not my jam but i studied film and tv and um you know you don't really i don't think there are i don't think there are classes that exist in casting casting is a is a job in which you have to you know you have to work your way up, you have to be an intern, you have to be an assistant, you have to, you know, you learn by doing, literally. Yeah. So I was an assistant for a long time, and then I was an associate for a long time, and then I uh, went off on my own, and um, yeah, was casting a show, was casting a pilot, and I met the producers from um, HBO Independent Productions. My first pilot was for them, that's how I got to know. Uh, Dave Bardis and Lowell Mate and all the, those guys and then they're the ones who said hey we have this pilot and would you like to meet Phil Rosenthal and um, it was a it was a good meeting <laughs> oh that's oh that, that's your exit line um, yeah so then just to, for, just for a little framework for people uh, Ray did a Letterman, so, a Letterman set one of the I producers um, Letterman's company, Worldwide Pants, knew somebody at HBO Independent Production, a guy named Stu Smiley, and they made that introduction. So the, the show was produced by Worldwide Pants, Letterman's company, and HBO Independent Productions, Correct. which was HBO's thing. I, Lisa, I like your answers are very succinct, like it is a legal proceeding we're doing here. That's correct. You are correct. That's I'm bound by my answers. Um, yeah, so they... Um you know, look, there there was a trend in sitcoms at the time. Uh, a lot of stand-ups had sitcoms, and Ray had had a, a fantastic set on um, on Letterman, and I think he had been doing, remember he was doing um, Dr. Katz, professional therapist. He had been doing, a, a, you know, plan, he'd been doing voiceover work on that. Um, so um, they, he and Phil met, and this wonderful script was written, and, um, uh, you know, so I sat down with Phil and we started talking about the show and about what, you know, what we wanted this world to be, what we wanted this, who we wanted this family to continue. And so then your initial, me so <clears throat> Lisa, the people who watch this all the time, so I've been doing this, my first time interviewing someone was Phil because I was promoting his show, which reminds me, I need a drink of coffee, which I'm taking from... <laughs> I just randomly took it out of my uh, closet right. of mugs. Right. Uh, people who watch us know how familial uh, and how friendly Everest Raymond's environment was. And yeah. I, I want to hear some of your experience, a lot of your experiences, but just to contrast, because a lot of people uh, are not in the uh, world of show business, there are some shows where the people don't get along at all and you don't see each other after the show ends. It's like, that's a wrap, everybody and we hate each other and we'll never see each other again, or even worse, the show gets canceled and it's not. So the upside of even if people don't get along well on a hit show is people made a good living and it's positive at least for them financially. Right. So, but you don't know going into the meeting with Phil, is Phil an egomaniac? Is he gonna be someone I can work with? Is he gonna be, I want, uh, I want a tall blonde as the wife. And then you bring him all these tall blondes. And he's like, these are terrible. Where are the dark haired short women? You know, you know, it, it's funny. What I remember about the process was the script was so great. The pilot script was so funny. There were jokes 
multiple jokes on every page. That makes everyone's job easier, but mine especially in that instance. And what was great about that process was, you know, we kind of thought about, well, oh, it would be great if someone was kind of like this or if someone was sort of like that person, but there wasn't, there wasn't anything concrete in anyone. And it's sort of about, you know, you know, the old adage, you know, best idea wins. It was about the funniest person is going to come in the room. I will say, um, you know, as written, the uh, uh, Brad's character, Robert, um, you know, Phil had sort of Ray's real life brother in mind, who was more your shorter, stouter, kind of a jolly big guy. And that's sort of where we, that, that's where we started with that character. And the thing about the Brad part of this, and yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure this story, I know this story, um, but, um, you know, we, so we were reading, James Gandolfini was on my list. <laughs> and that's where we were going with auditions. And I had worked on, I had I'd hired Brad, I, I worked on Fresh Prince, and he had done a Fresh Prince, and then I was working on this show about um, Marines in outer space. And there was an episode where somebody, uh, where they had found someone who was hidden in a tank on, uh, on this planet, and Brad auditioned, and he got the role, and I booked him, and a few days later, I got a call from the producers, and they said, we have to fire Brad Garrett. And I said, well, no. He hasn't even started yet. And they said, fit in the team. Could not physically fit <laughs> person in the team. Fire him and then fire him. And this had happened just a few months before. And so as I was setting up sessions for the pilot, I thought, about that. but I felt so bad about that firing. You know what? He won't be right what Phil wants to see, but it'll be fun and it'll be fun and it'll be, it'll, it'll be a, it'll take the day, you know? Right. I'm away from that session. Like that was a, but, and that was it. Like Brad walked in the door, he opened his mouth to speak and character in that. So that's the part of casting that's fun because everyone can have an Ed, you can have a pro think, oh I want the you know the TV version of that movie star but until an actor walks in the door there, the words on the page you know that's, that's all very fluid yeah so th that's a great story and I didn't know that story so only because I'm seeing some questions and we're you're you're uh, there are some people for example in Croatia who aren't don't know that Brad was on French Fresh Prince of, of Bel Air. He was he on an episode? Episode of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, yes. Okay. Was and that, was that the first show that you were casting? Or you didn't I, cast that? No, I, I didn't cast the pilot. I cast um I cast the last two seasons of that show. Okay. So. And, and and so Lisa, just to go back there what you're trying to do for a casting person, because now I'm gonna tell you just uh, for people watching from the inside, if we had a part on Raymond, because we're going to get back to the whole cast, but if you had a part on Raymond, if you wrote uh, an episode, you would go in for the final decision. Now, Phil is incredibly busy when you're running a show. So Lisa would grab uh, 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 people, select it, narrow it down, and let's say eight people were c would come in. I don't know what the magic number was, but, and some of them would hit it out of the park and you would go, oh my gosh. And every occasion you'd be like, there's two people that are unbelievable. Like, right. what do we do? And so the, it's always hit and miss because I just want to talk about the actual addition in the moment in the room. Some people can excel at that and right. other people don't excel. And yeah. what ends up happening sometimes is the person excels in the room. Then we start the week and the person does not excel. Right. And we go, where was what we saw in the room? The person nailed it. So it's, it's not just, and you, you have to think in terms of a lot of people are unknown 
to a certain degree. So Brad Garrett is 100% uh, uh, unknown to as far as ish. I mean, you know, look, he I, maybe he had done this. Remember his Seinfeld episode? Sure, the car and guy. Like a couple of months before the Raymond pilot, but you know, and you know, he was a, he was a comedian and Star Search, like so, you know. I knew him, but probably, you know, mo most right. people. Okay. And what I'm saying unknown, when I say unknown, I mean, there's no enormous body of work to know, oh, he can deliver. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And, so, and so that, because you mentioned Dr. Katz, and just for people watching, the reason that the show is called Everybody Loves Raymond is because Ray's real life brother picked up a cable ace award that ray won for his appearance on dr katz and ray's real life brother goes everybody loves raymond so that and in the irony of ironies we cast jonathan katz in oh. what the, in the role and right. he didn't do it well no. and so and which is fine because ray romano was fired from news radio for not doing it well and it worked out it worked out so Absolutely. it's not yes. yeah Yes. So, so Lisa, that Brad story, which I did not know, that to me, you should take the rest of your career off because that, <laughs> that to me, because Brad, well, we, we know the ensemble is this lightning in a bottle, but. Yes. Yes. And it's in, you know, I, 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 when, when I started thinking about what this would be today, I was thinking about the pilot and I was thinking about the parents. And, you know, I don't know that Phil and I actually ever had this conversation, but it kind of occur it occurred to me since, you know, when we were, you know, you start, casting directors start by making lists. You go, okay, Carol Connor, Gene Stapleton, and you know, the list starts there, and you go, and then you check availabilities, and then if, oh, someone's on a show, or someone is uh, doing a movie, they're not available, and there's all, there's all this back and forth with lists and avail and, um, you know, and, and there are certain actors who, when they reach a certain point in their careers, don't audition, they would take a meeting, sometimes on an offer, you know, there are all these different iterations of, you know, what, what, uh, what, who comes in the room to read is not always who you want to come in the room. Anyways, so, um, but I really, I think that we were very aware of, we wanted the parent to be, I think we stayed away from the bigger names. You know, we didn't talk about Carol O'Connor and Gene Stapleton because that thing in a sitcom where the per you know, whether it's Kramer on Seinfeld or, uh, 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 you know, Doris bursting in the room on Raymond, the, the person who walked the room unannounced without, like, that's a big, that's a big moment. That's a big entrance. You, I, I didn't, in my head, I was, I thought, I didn't want the TV like to tip over. You know what I mean? I didn't want the screen to be weighted unequally in the parent's favor. You know what I mean? That Sure. Um, Lisa, yeah, uh, only because I'm seeing some comments. Uh, is there any chance that your microphone is covered or anything or you have? Uh, uh, better? Uh, it just cuts in and out a little have, bit. Have some Everyone's make my phone not tip over so maybe that will be better all right we'll see we'll hope so uh it it's it's but so what you're saying just because i'm going to summarize because it's a little bit cut out yeah what you don't want is these iconic people to walk in potentially up front where you go uh all right ray is lost the wife is lost the tall brother is lost and this this legendary actor walked right. in right you wanted there to be you wanted it to be balanced you wanted it to be Want to, I want to know who these people are who are bursting in the door, but I don't want it to feel weighted too much in their direction. And so um, with Peter, uh, I had I was working on a show and some of the X-Files producers were involved. And one of the producers who was a pal of mine, he grabbed me and he goes, you have to watch a rough cut of this episode. The X-Files where Peter... Uh, you know, um, could see the future. He could see uh, when, whenever he knew when people would die. He was an insurance salesman. It, an iconic episode of X Files, so great. And uh, my friend Glenn showed me this episode, and I, I just thought, this is like this is such. I, first of all, who didn't love Peter Boyle already? But to see this different side of him, um, so uh, you know, whenever I was going out on pilot meetings, I, and I met on a pilot before Raymond that I didn't get. And there was a father in it, and I said, 
I think this father should be Peter Boyle. And the producer said, I don't know. I see someone else. And I thought, and I didn't get that pilot and that was fine. But, um, but I really had Peter on my brain for that role. Um, and in terms of Doris, you know, Doris had been directing a play, she was out of town. She, you know, she didn't come from meeting a lot of people. And we cast this pilot in a very short amount of time. I mean, maybe four weeks, five weeks long. Typically, we cast the pilot in 10 weeks for a pilot. 10 weeks. Yeah, I'm just repeating because uh, uh, typically it takes longer, 10 weeks. Right. Rose Raymond was something called a presentation pilot, which means they're not really, they don't really have high hopes. They're basically saying, we're not going to throw a lot of money after this. Right. It's a little bit of a afterthought compared to the big stars that we have coming out. So what Lisa said is four to five weeks. It was a quick casting process. And uh, so we'll keep going. Cause I want to go back again to hit a couple of things you mentioned. Right. So, um, so should I, should I want, want, me, want me to finish the Doris part of this? Finish the Doris, yeah. So, so Doris had been directing a play. She was out of town. And we had been reading a lot of people, and it really wasn't happening. And finally, her agent called me and said, she's back. She, she really wants to come. Oh, thank God, please. I think in my heart, I kind of knew, like, she would know. she would know what it takes for this role. And so I set her up. The session, was, the session started. I went out to, wait, to the waiting room to grab her. And as we walked back in the door, she, she grabbed my hand. And, and she said, listen to me. If I don't get the role, I'm going to tear up my throat. And it, I, I, it was this, there was something fierce about her. She knew. Yeah. She knew. If, 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 I, if, if, if I don't, uh, sorry, Lisa said, if I don't get this role, I'm going to tear up my SAG card. Your SAG card, for those watching, is called the Screen Actors Guild card. So basically, I'm out of the business right. if I don't get this role, is what uh, uh, Lisa was saying. And so now I just want to go back. Uh, Peter Boyle was on the um, X-Files, and we didn't... So Ray and I don't know any of this information that you're sharing, but the first year of Ebro's Raymond, Ray and I shared an apartment and Peter lived above us. And so Peter leaves one day because the Emmys, for those of you watching, the Emmys happen really before the season starts. So when you're watching the Emmys, you're watching everything from last year. So Peter, who you know, we, knew, we knew now at least for four weeks from rehearsing, he gets into a limo and he leaves. And we're like, wow, he's in show business, you know, because... Ebra's Raymond, I don't think maybe it had just aired or hadn't aired yet. So uh, he got leaves and then he comes back with a with an Emmy. And we're like, oh, that's it. You just win an Emmy. Uh, you know, you, go, you get into your tux, you leave and you win an Emmy. And right. the, uh, the irony is he didn't win an Emmy on Ebra's Raymond, which we know we all know he deserved an Emmy and he deserved many Emmys. Unfortunately, Brad Garrett was also up against him, who won, I think, Brad won three or four Emmys. Yes. And, yeah. And so uh, uh, it, it's unfortunate they were the, the same category. So then let me ask you this. You were in the, in the um, casting office mm -hmm. when Peter got lost and walked into the thing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So can you tell a little bit of that? And, and when your mic cuts out, I'll just fill in what's missing. Okay. Um, you know, it, it was... Um... You know, first of all, we were casting at Universal. It's huge. It's the city. It's it, so, and he had parking over here, but then that was full, so they sent him somewhere else. But um, yeah, by the time he found us in the bowels of this weird building in the back, we were like in the I don't know. It was, good. but I mean, he was mad. Like he was like the steam was coming out of his ears, and you know that's there's a lot of Frank in that. There's a lot of Frank <laughs> in that patience and in that like, what's going on? And, you know, so I, I just, I mean, the two of them, that, that was spectacular. That really, really was. That was, that to me, you know, was not, not just, it was such an, an integral part of what that show was about, you know, and- um, uh, uh, Frank and Marie, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think just for people watching who know, uh, Marie really drove 
the episodes. So you couldn't, Marie is the vi very much the villain, even though she's coming from a place of love. And mm -hmm. when you see the show, you can't imagine anyone else playing any of the characters because no, no. they're just, it's like, you know, when you have a, a, a baseball team or a football team or soccer team, or, there's usually not the weaker, there's a weaker player and whatever you make. This is every single person could hit a home run and was the greatest at what they did. And so, yeah. Definitely, so then, definitely murderers row there all with that cast. And you know, the same thing, like, you know, this, I, I knew it when, when Doris came in and read and Peter took that meeting and then we, I, I feel like Dor, did Doris read at the network, Doris came to the network and then we had, we talked and, and we said, somebody said, what do we think of, of, of Doris with Peter? And, and everybody just said, yes, yes, please. Yes. And it's funny because, you know, when I, when casting directors make notes, you know, an actor comes in to read and you go, nice job, not this, really interesting, not quite what's written, but, you know, funny and. and internal notes, internal notes. Notes that you write. Right. And, um, <laughs> Because Pat and Patty came in, you know, and Patty, we had, you know, there had been, we had taken people to network for the Deborah role and not had success. And um, her agent called me and said, what, are, what about Patty Heaton? And I was literally like that V8, like, oh my God, of course, why didn't I, why didn't I think of that? And she came in, she was going to just be a meeting and um, she came in and that, so do you just want me to read? Because I, I know I'm supposed to just meet, but I'm, I'm happy. To and ever, of course, you, yes, please. That's what we want. Yes, that would be great. And she opened her mouth. She started reading that scene. And I circled her name and I wrote bingo. That's what I have in my notes. I still have my notebook from the and Like, it was it. We knew. Like, yeah. When it was just, that was very... Everything was on the page for them. The all of the necessary information they needed was there. Yeah. That, so that part was really exciting. So then, let me just just to uh, uh, go back a little bit. What what Lisa is referring to is when an actor gets to a certain stature, their agent says they're not going to read. Like it's it's it's, uh, and I might be inaccurate in characterizing this way, but it's almost like. It's beneath them. They're so talented. We know who they are. They're not going to go in and, and do an audition like some unknown. Right. Right. And so at the point where Patty comes in, uh, we're, we, there's already been, I think, 200 women looked at. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they're really searching. And it's very hard to have someone who's attractive, who has, can play drama, and can deliver comedy. It's right. the rarest of rare. Exactly. You know? Yes. And so, by the way, I think what we're getting to is that really the weak, weak link in the show was Ray, and he'll be the first one to admit it. And so, uh, uh, but with, so when Patty came in, uh, um, from, from what I remember her characterizing, it's like, she's talking, 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 and like, you're, you're not, you're not going to ask her to read because it was told she won't read. Right, right. And so when she offered it up, it, it felt like a gift. And, and by the way, you know, the other thing about the Deborah character, I think, and, you know, again, this is nothing that I, this is nothing that occurred to me at the, at the, during the pilot process, but I do really think there's something about Deborah. There's a little bit of that, of that Marilyn Munster in that character. You know what I mean? Right. Normal person surrounded by the crazies. Crazy surrounded by the maniacs right and that's sort of how you, you you sort of see them through her eyes a little bit you know Marilyn Munster or um you know I, I thought about that when I watched Schitt's Creek because you know like Patrick on Schitt's Creek like he's the character like he's normal and they're all strange around him and it helps you understand how that all works um but yeah no and and, and I think and I think did Patty say like, "Oh, you want to read the scene where yes, like you know, like she was," that. <laughs> and she actually could, yeah. so so yeah that that was uh, that that was super. So 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 I think I'm going to say this, which uh, I was told by the head of comedy of a network, mm -hmm. and they said to me, Tom, because that's my name. They right. said uh, a show that has the greatest writing you've ever read with a mediocre cast will not survive. 
but a show with an unbelievable cast and not so great writing will survive. And so as a writer, you're like, oh, shit, you know, that's that stinks. But right. when you see when you write that bingo over Patty Heaton in however, you know, in one minute, right. like, you know, and just that like when you would see uh, this is nothing about the stand ins, but when one of the actors was absent for a run through mm -hmm. and it was our full cast, but missing one one of the people. And so a stand in had to come in. You would watch it and go, uh, I'm probably the worst writer that ever was because this material just doesn't work. Right. And by the same token, when you would see that first table read, which I do want to get to uh, with you, Lisa, and the, and the cast brings it alive. You're like, oh, my God. Like, I couldn't even imagine how great yep. that could be delivered. Absolutely. Um, all right. So Patty Heaton, great. Bingo. You have everybody. You're, you're, you're stuck with Ray because he's, he's, they're building the show around him. Now, let me, I'm just going to go back before we continue just uh, and answer some of these questions before I get way to questions for you, Lisa. Okay. You can't go away. I'm ready um, you. Um, uh, you must have been very young, Lisa, when working on Raymond. That's a compliment to you. That's uh, yep, that's very nice. Yes. Yeah, I was young. Like I said, it was my I, 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 yeah my early thirties, and you know, uh, it's a lifetime ago. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to help you, Lisa. We're in we're in Hollywood. Lisa was in her late teens when she said early thirties. She meant late teens. Um, okay. Uh, do you have a, uh, did you have any different, so this from Leo in Toronto, did you have any real viewpoint, uh, any different viewpoint on selecting the cast versus what Phil had in mind? No, no, we were totally aligned. Look, and there, th that's a good question because sometimes it's true. Casting directors want to cast the role, whether it's, you know, the weekly co-star or the lead of the pilot, you know, there are, there are some, projects that you work on where you realize you're not going to um your voice will not be heard right your voice will or your voice will be ignored shall we mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. um, i have um i have lost jobs i will say um where i have voiced my opinion you know and i can tell that the train is heading in one direction and i'll say hey listen i don't know that people are gonna buy that and um yeah i i've I've lost more than a couple of jobs. I, yeah. I, but, you know, look, that's, I, I think that's why people hire casting directors because you want someone who has a strong opinion. There was, I had, there were, no one wavered from where we were going. We, we, the cast we wanted is the cast we got. Definitely. Yeah. So, so only because, uh, I don't know if she's still watching, but uh, Alex Manessis just says, uh, you're the best casting director ever. Now, I don't know if that's Alex just, trying to get on your good side so you'll keep using her but i have hired alex many times since uh alex mm -hmm. and I did a pilot together a few years ago pa alex and i did a series together a few years ago y yeah i love yeah her. so yeah so so alex you don't have to compliment lisa anymore uh in publicly and also how we'll get to her and stefania because that was just a home run casting um uh, now, let me just go through uh, the president. Uh, yes. Any doubts on the cast when they were all hired and ready to start? No, no. The, the, the table read was was fantastic. Rehearsals were great. Tape night was great. It just it felt it, you, there was stardust there. You just you just look now. So we had done our part. But now the show gets picked up we're on fridays at 8 30. who what you, you know you know i i didn't watch tv's fridays at 8 30 and I, so and so now it's up to the network universe that exists that we have nothing to do with we have no control over you know are they gonna spend money to promote it like there's all these things that are so you go oh I, that we made a really nice pilot oh they picked us up great we're gonna make a great series um i will say uh, the episode that Gene Stapleton did in season one, um, I wish I were Gus, I think, is that the episode? Yes, that's it. That's episode three. So, you know, we knew we wanted uh, to take a big swing there to get a, a real name. And Gene was at the top of my list and we made an offer and she said yes. And she <laughs> said, as I said, I, you know, we, we hadn't even, we hadn't aired yet. It was, yeah. you know, and she said, when I saw the cast list page of the script that you sent, she said, that's when I knew. So it 
So there was something, I, I think I, I felt a little velocity there. You know, there was some excitement to have someone who was such a CBS name, you know, an iconic CBS star kind of give her kiss of love to our show. Um, you know. Yeah. And, and, and for people in Uzbekistan who are watching, uh, Gene Stapleson was on a show called All in the Family, which was the top show in the early 70s and an iconic show for CBS, which is a network in the United States, and there were only three networks. And that show uh, uh, really kept CBS as this number one network for a very long time. And when Everybody's Raymond started, CBS had fallen from grace and was the number three uh, network in TV. And people would make fun of being on CBS. And what Lisa's talking about being on Friday night, we were number, we finished number 85 in the ratings that year and so the very survival of the show was in question but we knew first three episodes four episodes five episodes the quality of the shows were there it's just that there was nobody watching right so right. uh uh hello mrs a is it a l star she's thanking uh yes for such a great show it's on every morning in the uk um yes okay so thank you donnell someone's asking about why did we switch the twins after the first episode? You know, it's funny. I, I, well, first of all, there were, there were triplets. In the pilot, it was triplets. Ah. And, you know, and there's, and, and this is not why, but there, so triplets are usually identical twins and a single, you know, there's not really identical triplets. There's, anyway, um. and so there wasn't a seamless match of the kids so did that I, I i can't speak to why this happened you know this information reaches me once it's been decided and it's basically now you have to go you know now please fix this um so and you know we knew that um uh we knew that um madeline had you know twin baby brothers um but they were much younger than the twins as written. And I feel like we saw some other, you know, you, you babies come in, you, you, the parents bring the babies in and look and the baby, you know, smiles and wait, it's, it's baby casting is, is it's really just baby looking kind of a thing. Yes. Um, so um, yeah, that I don't know why. That's a good yeah. So, so Phil said, uh, when I asked Phil, he didn't remember. It's funny because it sounds like it's some mysterious controversy. But right. I think it just fell through the cracks, the reason why. But I thought either they were going to be too old or something was going to happen because it, you know, when it got picked up, it was six months later. But I, I honestly don't know. And I don't know anybody that does know. No, no. Yeah. No. So, but it worked out perfectly because uh, now you only have one family that has to teach right. their kids on stage. Right. And, and those were identical. These are great questions, everybody. So let me just go back. Um, so this one you will, you will laugh at. I'm going to summarize. Let okay. me see if I can get to it, uh, which is <laughs> basically. So once you cast the show, did you, that was it for you? You kind of took off and, 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 or were you involved in anything else after that? <laughs> so. Uh you mean in, in terms of Everybody Loves Raymond or television? Yes. No, no, not television. So I'm not saying after Raymond. I'm saying you finished the pilot. Okay, Phil, here's your, here's your award-winning cast. This is Lisa signing off for the rest of the series. So I think it's a genuine, I'm making fun, but it's God. a genuine question of what do you, I know from being on the show, but what do you do once you've, all the heavy, initial heavy lifting is done? Um, you know, then, then if you're lucky enough and they want to have you back for the episodes, you are engaged, your services are engaged for that job now. So uh, any speaking role on Everybody Loves Raymond, um, you know, we cast, we, you know, we read the actors, you, you present them to Phil, decisions are made, they're hired. Um, yeah. So, you know, all, all nine. All yeah. So, so just for people watching, uh, cause it is a legitimate question. Cause you would think like, well, let's see now. You cast five people, and then every show that has a guest star. So if you were a casting director on something like Friends, where there's just an insane amount of guest stars, you yes. know, that, that seems obvious. But uh, on Everest Raymond, you have to – so Lisa had an office. She had – you would walk into her office. Her office was 
two doors down from my office, at least from season three on. I, what's that? Right near the writer's room. Right. So exactly. You were right around the corner from the writer's room. So what would happen is every once in a while, and I'll, I will find this too. I have a picture of Ray in season one. We were at Hollywood Center Studios. And I think your office was your office at the end of the production. Yeah, there was okay. a killer thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ray and I shared an office that year. And around the corner from our office was your office. And so Ray was just looking at one of the million headshots that came in. And so he, here's the thing. If you have Evers Raymond and you now have to have a guest star on a show in three episodes from now, you have to nail that part. So right. even though from the outside, people watching might be like, yeah, so it's one girl, but it's like, okay, but you have to comb through. And so just give me an example, Lisa, of we're gonna cast the vacuum cleaner saleswoman on Everybody Loves Raymond, okay? You, right. might not even, you might not even remember that, but that goes out where? I'm talking about 2000s, not now. Okay, so uh, I, I have a script for, you know, episode 12 of the season, and I send it to a service called Breakdown um, uh, that all the agents in uh, Los Angeles subscribe to. And at the time, uh, it was through fax. Uh, you, you know, agents would come into their office on Monday morning and they would have a fax and it would say, uh, Lisa's casting the, uh, I don't know, the cult, the cult leader, the, the Susan Yigley role, um, you know, casting that role, it would describe the character, uh, the age, sort of the storyline of the episode, and then agents uh, based on that would at the time would call me, pick up the phone and call me. Um, and then they would send me a packet full of headshots of actors who they thought were appropriate for this. So, you know, a big agency would send me 25 people and a small agency would send me three people. And I used to comb through these headshots one by one, sitting on the floor. Um, and now this is all done online, you know, so, um, but uh, yeah, so then I would, I don't know, I, I love to read actors. That's my favorite thing. And that's, 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 in terms of casting, what I miss the most about my job is now uh, casting directors are, everything is on a self tape, is through self tapes or through Zoom. So I don't get to be in a room reading actors. Um, so, but I would, you know, I don't know, read 40, 50, 60 people for that role. And then, you know, sort of like then the session for Phil is the greatest hits, you know, the eight, the eight favorite people, the eight funniest people, the eight types that are the most interesting that are making the most interesting choices for this and then i bring that session to phil and phil makes the final decision uh, and, and by the way all of that so that's a crazy amount of work because there's also what if you don't find someone by the deadline the show must be made I, I'm, I'm just telling the people watching like there is a pressure that uh lisa you brought us eight not so good people now what do we do we're right. we're, we're going in two weeks so you, you so, really want, but look, here's the thing on Raymond. We always had scripts ahead of time, which is a gift and not always the case. You know, we, we used to come back from hiatus and, you know, there would be six, seven, eight, nine scripts on my desk, which is a gift. So I could look through it and I could say, oh, great. We're going to need Deborah's parents for episode four and episode nine. And I'll pin them for those dates. And uh, I, you know, it, to be ahead of the curve in terms of that is a gift and you hopefully get started in, with enough lead time so that you're not down to the wire. Um, I don't feel like we ever really kind of had to. No, well, uh, yeah, and let me just give a little more framework. So most shows start up in the beginning of the year in June and the writers show up June 1st and they go, okay, let's start breaking stories and let's write our stories. So, and we're gonna start shooting in two months or six weeks. And so then Lisa gets the first uh, sorry, the casting director might get the first script, you know, a month before. We worked over the hiatus. So we finished 10 scripts at the beginning, nine or 10 scripts. So Lisa can see 10 scripts June 1st. So she has two months potentially to cast, a little bit less pro probably, but that's a total anomaly. That is, oh, I I've never heard of another show doing oh, it. No, yeah. no. And, but also, look, you also, you need to, you, you don't want to do it too far out. You know, you don't want to. Yeah, because they booked a movie and yeah. Exactly. I they're, don't want they're, they're in Bulgaria now doing a movie. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, timing, timing is a lot of it. Yes. Uh, uh, Cedric Yarborough is saying hello. Um, 
uh, uh, Karen Cooney. Yes, Karen, great questions. I'm going to go back because there was a, another great one, Karen. So, uh, so, so just to, uh, uh, before I, a- I answer, or have you answer this question, so Lisa had an office at Evers Raymond from the beginning to the very end. Some weeks are busier than, the, than other, but there's never nothing to do for Lisa. There's never... Well, I, have- I will say, I, I, I feel like at one point during the run of the show, I counted there. We did a lot of episodes where it was just our series regulars and there was no guest cast. Right. You can do those bottle episodes when you have a cast like that. And, you know, sometimes a show will do it because they're out of money or they can't afford a guest star or they can't afford a swing set that week or whatever it is. But look, what was interesting on our show is what took place in that room on that couch said by those five people. So, you know, that was also, you know, that, 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 was a, that was a gift as well. Yeah, so of, of the shows, and I used to tell this during the show to anybody I knew who was an actor and actress, I'd be like, I'm really sorry, but I work on the worst show possible for getting your friend or someone you know onto a show because the outside cast, and this is so much because of Phil's focus and Ray's focus, it's just you want to see the family. You want to. You don't want an outside cast member. You know the shows are are they come from the story out. So it's not like you're sitting there going, "We need a funny, you know, a heavier set funny person to be in the show." Right. Uh, uh, and I'm not describing Kevin James, even though I am. But the episodes, yeah. Point inwards on our show. You know, like that's where that's where the interesting things happen. Yeah. Yeah. And when you go back, it's funny because I mentioned uh, Desi Arnazi, the Blue Sea pilot. They had uh, uh, a clown that was a, f- a friend of Desi's, Pepito, a famous international like performer. And when you watch it now, you love the regular cast so much. You're like, oh, get, I don't, you know, I mean, at that point he was a giant star. Yeah. You know, means nothing to you, to us now. Right. Because it's, well, because you've grown to like them. So let me, uh, Lisa, there's a few quickies and I want to go back to a longer question. Um, the, uh, the casting of uh, just the, only the stunt casting. So some, I'm going way back to the initial comments. Someone said, is that stunt casting? Stunt casting is really putting into an episode somebody who's of a magnitude that will increase ratings. Right. They think... It, Draw eyeballs to this episode because we are putting a famous person, whether they're playing themselves or they're playing a character. We're gonna we're gonna hire someone who we can promote. Who I right. Can promote. <clears throat> and so the first year, sorry, um, I wish I was. Hold on one second, Lisa. As I. Thanks, mm. Phil. Yes, I genuinely had a frog in my throat. Um, so then that leads to, so what Lisa was talking about earlier is not stun casting when she's saying balancing the cast where, where it's not, you know, the world, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't walk in as the father. Now, and you have all unknowns, you, 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 it's so hard to come back and make this a long-term balanced show. That's not stun casting. On our show, to get ratings, because we were number 85, we finished at 85. At one point, I think we were 106 out of 110 shows i mean we, it was very much in question mm-hmm. so the big wigs at cbs said let's stunt cast let's put sports stars in the show Ooh. So, <laughs> so but if it helped us survive yay but on the internal side we were like boo because you don't want to see it and that's why you don't see any of those anymore because it was an extraneous part that when phil was forced to do that and again the network is saying do you want to stay on the air we're trying to get ratings for you that's right. where CBS was coming from. So Phil said, okay, thank you. And I'm going to make sure I write every single part where there's an, uh, a sports star so it can be cut out. And right. that's why a lot of people don't see that in, uh, in, um, in syndication on the, on, the, uh, on the reruns. So Lisa, having said all that, were you, you get the call like, we're going to have Tom and the Sorta in next week. Make the call, right? What, 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 where, what was that? Yeah, it was uh, see if Tommy Lasorda wants to do an episode. And he, with all of these people, it what I don't know. Do famous people like to make appearances on television shows? I I, I can't answer that question. Some but, do. You no, 
Well, sure. Um, then there were somewhere, you know, Ray's covering this sporting event. This is why he meets Christy Yamaguchi. But, you know, Tommy Lasorda, was he cooking sauce with Doris? Like, I mean. Uh, no, cooking sauce with Ray. Oh, right. In the kitchen. All right. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes, it was, it was hard to narrow down. People don't have availability. You know, we only had cameras a certain amount of days. It's a whole, you know, it's a whole thing. You've got to, someone has to fit into your, into what you need. So it, it was difficult and it, you know, I'm, I'm not, P.S. I'm not a sports person. So <laughs> not anything that I. Um, so, uh, yeah. So just for people watching, Ray was a sports writer. We know that. And uh, CBS said, who are the most famous people right now that we can get onto the show? So the MVP of a Super Bowl was on. Barry Bonds was on, who's a baseball player, for those of you in other countries, a famous baseball player. Chris Yamaguchi did have a huge following. Right. You know, so so all, all of that helped. It was just a very extraneous part. And it, it applies just like if you're watching I Love Lucy and there's a famous figure skater from 1952 in there, you're like, who? Why is this person in there? So yeah, uh, uh, so now Lisa, another question. Great questions, Karen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, uh, a lot of these people we have, and here's what here's what I'll say, Lisa. This is a community, the Evers Raymond vibe, feeling that has gone on for 15 years since the show ended, mm -hmm. just continues growing. So even though you and I and everybody has moved on to other things, it is a family for people, and so uh, it's great to see that we all still pretty much get along and it's, you know, if, if that, and you have worked with Phil again. And so it's like, Oh, we're getting the team back together would be the feeling like right. this well oiled machine that we're, we're, you know, everybody likes each other and this could tomorrow we could snap our fingers and be back together again. It's, so it's on giving. Yes. I, yes. So, okay. So here's another question. Can you, can you be a casting director for two shows simultaneously? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know that's it's interesting because um, during yes, you casting directors are not exclusive. So while m most every well, I guess hair and makeup can work on multiple shows. Cameramen, and, cameramen. Right, but um, casting directors can as well. So and that's something that I did throughout the in you know throughout throughout the entire run of Raymond. Um, I did King of Queens. Um, I, you know, I've, I, I've done, I've, I've continued to have multiple shows, luckily, throughout my career. But yes, uh, when King and Queen started, I was back and forth between those two shows. And yes, so, um, uh, it is possible. Yeah. Do that. Yes. Uh, now, let me ask you this, because I don't know if you're casting something like, for, and King and Queens has many more outside casts. Every show has more outside cast than Everose Raymond. There is no, there, I don't think there's any show that has uh, uh, less outside cast than Everose Raymond. Right. E even, I, even All in the Family, I think, had more outside right. cast members. Right. So if you were on a Friends, could you be doing two jobs, do you think? No. And it's funny because, you know, I did King of Queens. I did the pilot and I did the first two seasons of King of Queens because King of Queens was a very different, uh, you know, experience. It was a very different show. It was, it was P.S. it was across town. Um, you know, we were at Warner Brothers and they were at Sony. That's in Culver City. That's, a, you know. Yeah. A 45 minute hour drive. Um, and um, I so I, I was with King Queens for the first two seasons and then I, I, I stepped away from that. Um, yeah. So I uh, part of family and it was, it wasn't conducive to, um, you know, what I was focused on. Right. And I, it, it is what, what Lisa's talking about for people that don't live here. You have, let's say five main studios and the studio Sony studio Sony's, which is, in something called Culver City, if you have to go to Warner Brothers, which is where they shot Everett's Raymond, you could be talking about 45 minutes to an hour drive in a good, on a good day. And with LA traffic, you could be talking an hour and a half to get right. there. And right. so it, it would be different if perhaps she was casting two shows that were a stage apart on the same lot. That would be that, a very, definitely, yeah. Yes, like uh, uh, um, Big Bang and um, you know, mom, et cetera, Chuck Laurie shows. Yes. We're all, yes. yes. 
We're all in the same way. Uh, so now, Lisa, uh, I'm going back. Uh, this one question was, have you ever had somebody say no? And I think we should address the, the structure of who makes decisions. Okay. But have you ever had someone be like, uh, you know, I don't think that Brad Garrett would be good for this part. Please, please, please just try him. Have you ever slipped somebody in there where you, where you were like, or if somebody, do you usually get a hard no? Because you're sending eight people that they don't have a chance to say no to. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, are you talking about a producer? Did a producer say that? Yes. So let me just go back to, to the bigger power structure. The network has ultimate say. Yeah. The network doesn't necessarily care about a small part on the show. But when it comes to the casting of the initial characters in a pilot episode, the CEO, the president of a network, has veto power over everybody. Yes. And so Phil Rosenthal, who's the writer, or Larry David, let's say, who actually didn't even let him run Seinfeld at first, but they have, they have some power, but the network has wields a much heavier stick, and you really need to make that argument. Uh, uh, Phil, the showrunner, has to make a very impassioned argument. If the head of the network, who's writing the check, who decides whether to kill the show or not, if you say, I, I really want this person as the lead, you have a big fight. If you push back from that, you're, you're probably doomed, honestly. You know, if someone at the network feels strongly about something and you don't agree, you're, you're going to have a target on your back. Like, what, you know, so, but yes, I, I've, I've done pilots where the note is, um, we're going to recast her because she's not funny. Well, now she's been on three hugely... Uh, <laughs> And yes. You said well, that, but whatever. Okay, sure. Look, it's all subjective. You know, uh, you know, not everyone likes someone in the same way. It just it's so you, you can't you know, look, it, it's very hard to push back with an it, it just if, if they feel strongly about something and it, it's it's not a winnable fight, that's yes. not, that's not the hill to die on, right? Yeah. So just to go back to the initial question. So if Lisa has an idea. Once you get into your past the pilot where they look at everything, they're, they're betting a million dollars and plus yeah. on pilots now, much more now, but they're betting a crazy amount of money. The network has a say, so your power is not there uh, then. But later on, season four of the series, the show is a hit. Now you have someone like a Phil Rosenthal who says, uh, you know, we're casting this part. Uh, I, I know you get it through a script and you're like, okay, I need five women to play a um, vacuum cleaner salesperson. At that point, you can bring anybody you want. Re you know, obviously yeah. You, you can, yeah, you can bring anyone you want. So and and the network will say, Ooh, will you try this person? Like we like this person from this thing or yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and sometimes Lisa would come into the writer's room and go, Hey, Phil, uh, uh, here's who I'm thinking, or Phil will call Lisa, like, can you just come in here and, and chat? It saves a lot of wasted time. Like, uh, uh, Lisa will come in and go, what do you think about her, 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 just to save a little bit of time? Uh, uh, so it's very much a teamwork environment. So there's not, the, 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 the casting of the initial cast is a much bigger roll of the dice. Like, what about this person? Okay. And Lisa, when we are sitting, when, when, when someone's cast, so, okay, I wrote the young girl episode. We have to cast the young girl, okay? Right. So Phil, because uh, he was very democratic, he's like, okay, you're the writer. Come into the room with us. Right. So we're now in Phil's office. Lisa's there. His, her assistant's there. Phil Rosenthal's there. Now eight girls come in, and we sit there and watch. So Lisa has to see if she's brought in eight women that are terrible, she looks bad and also we're like oh my god that never happened by the way it's always like okay now we have to you know, we have three who are good one's a different feeling one's a you know right. etc and so that you're you're always trying to get and i'm going to tell you a friend of mine whose husband was an actor she was saying you know hollywood really rewards mediocrity and i didn't even know what that comment meant uh, it sounded like a slightly resentful comment from someone who had a someone who wasn't working. But when that person comes into the room, you only want your script and the show to be everybody has the same goal. There's right. no 
it's not the 1940s where the big cigar chomping head of, you know, Harry Cohn or whatever is the head of Columbia. And he goes, this is my girlfriend and she's in the movie. You know, that that does that happen? Probably. But for the most part, uh, 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 you know, you just whoever scores, scores. It's and the process is democratic. It really is. It's, you know. We're going to, I'm going to bring in this person because I saw her on that show and she was funny and I just met this girl and isn't she interesting? And ooh, this one who was in that movie. And I know that Phil saw, you know, I, I, you try and, you try and blend all these things together. And, but look, I, there's plenty of sessions where eight people come in and we didn't find it. So, you know what? I'll make another session. Like, yeah, it, it's, keep, it's what it is. Keep, keep looking. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, and I think there's a trust over time. There's a trust in, in, uh, in the casting person, especially when it's Lisa. But also, you and also you can hear. It's interesting. You can hear someone will hit a joke, and it'll make you think of another actor. Or sometimes, like I, I can, I, I, I did a pilot once. And I could not cast this role. And the, I, I just could not find the person. And literally the last person who came in, the person who booked it, read one line. And I was like, oh, that's how that joke is. I, 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 was, I had the joke wrong in my head. And the person who showed me what the joke was, she booked the role. That's awesome. That, and so off of that, Lisa, because as I knew would happen, we are almost out of time. Uh, yeah, and we haven't we, we, we have so much more to cover. If you're giving advice, because uh, if you give advice to a writer, it's like write as many scripts as you can, write a bunch of spec scripts, get them into hands, be a nice person, because it's not only the writing on a sitcom I'm talking about, you have to sit in a room with somebody potentially for nine years. And if you're annoying and you don't know how to compromise, you're not going to last. So just for that actress where it seems like I'm never going to get a part in in anything, what and you've touched upon it already by you see them in as much stuff as possible but what advice would you give i think to be an actor today um i think if you have to act or else you will die it's a fantastic profession um i get for i, I cast a cbs sitcom now uh for a guest lead I get 500 to 1,000 submissions for wow. one, one person gets that job. So there's just, the numbers are just against you. So if you really feel, I, I, I think that if actors want to give it a try, hey, I'm going to go to LA, I want to try to be an actor. Set yourself a time limit. Tell yourself, I'm going to give this two, three years in that amount of time I want to find an agent and join a theater group and do, you know, three rounds of classes at UCB and, you know, do, like do things that will help you work towards your goal. Um, but, you know, it, it, after that, it's, it's, it, look, I, I love actors. I, I love everything about them. I, I, I love them. But they share when in the room to read. So it, it, it's a, it's a very tough business. It is. So, yeah. So I think what Lisa's, uh, uh, I feel bad, Lisa. It's just that every once in a while you're breaking up. So, uh, uh, and not emotionally, I just mean, uh, um, uh, and actually, you know, Lisa, now's a good time. Can you smile big? Cause I need to, I need to find a frame. Oh, that looks perfect. Yeah. Smile big. <laughs> Great. That's my screen, screen grab moment. Um, uh, to me, the advice is, well, you hit it. If you must, if you, it's the only thing you're going to do or you will die, then you're just going to keep doing it. But uh, the best thing is, especially now, which we didn't have 10 years ago, is make as many projects as you can and make the videotype and give yourself, make yourself a reel right. to help someone like Lisa have information to go, okay, right. so, so you trying to schmooze and meet people and get, you know, and be, be nice to Lisa at a coffee shop doesn't necessarily help you as much as because she can't judge. So if you make a reel and it doesn't have to be you, you're you're you, you're you're worried that it's not a network show. It doesn't matter. Talent will shine through That's and right. people. Yeah. People want talented people to help them look good. That's so, right. Write yeah. something for yourself. Shoot it with your friends. Go, you know, make a short film. Do you know, do all of these things where you can put this up on the internet and it can be found. And you know, this, 
there, look, there's no rules. That's the thing. There's no rules. Yeah. Um, uh, so Lisa, only because we're so now we're, uh, you, you, first of all, a lot of compliments that I'm not going to read uh, that you are pretty, which um, take, just take those compliments. Thank you very much. Um, so we have to talk about so many more things. Yes. So I'm, yeah. So I'm Let's hoping. Let's do this again. <laughs> yes. Uh, so maybe, uh, sorry, someone's comment is across town is an hour. Yes, across town is an hour, sometimes two hours in Los Angeles. I think across uh, town was an hour in 1998 when I, yeah, you know, when I, yeah, yeah, had, yeah, yeah. You know, so please, mm -hmm. no, no, no promises. <laughs> yeah. So when you think of Manhattan as cross town, yes, it's only, it's less than a mile across Manhattan or whatever it is. So right. yeah, this is a different thing. Right. Uh, Katarina Witt, yes, was on an episode. I was in that uh, episode. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So we'll cover. All the guest cast will cover Alex Manessis. Someone was asking about Tina Arning. Oh, Someone, Tina all, Arning. yeah, all these questions, all these questions. Lou Ferrigno from, uh, yes, from, from uh, uh, King of Queens, King of Queens, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll we'll talk. Um, all right. So Lisa, thank you so much. I hope that you know uh, Phil hasn't started movie night again uh, uh, in an official way. So hopefully sometime. Uh, and it, and the, then we'll catch up in earnest. But maybe in uh, in a little bit, you'll get that email from me and go, oh, again, Tom. OK, I would but love it. I would love. Yes, let's dive into like the next chunk of this. That would be it's really fun to think about. It's really fun to remember. It's really fun to talk about. Yeah. And you could actually do 20 minutes just on casting one role. And so we've really raced through a lot. Right. In a good way. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you to all the viewers out there all around the world. Great. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Alex Manessis, for all those hearts. I know they're not for me. Those are for Lisa. Um, all right. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Talk Thanks. to you soon. Bye. See you Bye. soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.